And again, happy Father's Day to all the fathers out there. Um, special day. Out of Third John, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. And then on the inside page, out of Luke 11, and it came to pass that he was praying in a certain place when he ceased. One of the disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. And he said unto them, When ye pray, say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so is in earth. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And he said unto them, Which of you shall have a friend, and shall go unto him at midnight, and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine in his journey has come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. For a friend of mine in his journey has come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. And he from within shall answer and say, Trouble me not, the door is now shut, and my children are in bed. I cannot rise and give thee. I say unto you, though he will not rise and give him, because he is his friend, yet because of his importunity, he will rise and give him as many as he needeth. That means his con uh, consistent asking. And I say unto you, knock, ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened. If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give for a fish a serpent? Or if he shall ask for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to him that ask him? Holy Spirit is a gift. And then on the back page, our Father in heaven. When Jesus taught us to pray, he began, our Father in heaven. Is one of many scriptures that refers to God as a father. I found it, find it both fascinating and instructive that when God wants us to know what he is like, he chooses to emphasize his fatherhood. What do we know about God as our father? According to Jesus' prayer, we know that our father in heaven is available and attentive to us. It's also clear that he provides for us. He forgives us and protects us from evil. What a wonderful pattern for fathers who aren't in heaven. Granted, there is only one perfect father in the universe, but as such, he sets the pace for the rest of us less than perfect fathers. I discovered early in my ministry that my children were not impressed with my books that I wrote, titles I had, or places I spoke. They craved my time and attention, the provision for a basic need, a love that patiently forgave, and the creation of a safe place for them to grow and mature. Here's a short but profound list of fatherly duties. And what about those who didn't get a dad who met those needs? Take heart in the fact that if you've been redeemed through Jesus, you have a perfectly heavenly father, and he is the best father of all. Thank you, God, for being our father, our shepherd, our guardian, our guide. We will never outgrow our need for your love and care. We want to seek you with all of our hearts that we might know you intimately. The Heavenly Father's arms never tire of holding his children. Awesome bulletin. Eh? Alright. My battery ran out, so I'm going to see if I can. I should have two, two good ones in here. But anyway, um, I tell you, the message of the Father is, is, is so great in this Bible, we're, we're only going to be able to touch the tip of the iceberg. What God has to say, not only about himself as a father, but also for the early fathers. 
he has just so much, much to say. And I got a pretty good story here today that is really gonna, really gonna set a set in motion what God wants us to see about Him and and how He feels about us. But first, I got. It's not really a joke, but a little something. I guess it's a joke. There's a lot of people that that think they know the Bible, but there's things that they don't know in there. Um, I think we did a really cool Bible study last Wednesday, and there was some pretty uh, cool stuff in there that maybe a lot of people didn't know. But there's a uh, there's this one thing probably not not a whole lot of people know about. Uh, you might know it, but you might not. But your Heavenly Father, He has this real, real, real big refrigerator in heaven. It's big. I can't remember the exact uh, measurements of it, but I think it's like 50,000 miles long and 50,000 miles high. And the cool part about it is that, that God, He doesn't really... He doesn't really use it to, to store food in. He doesn't really put food in there or, or water or anything else. He really doesn't do that. I'm on now. Yeah, God has this big refrigerator, and, and he doesn't use it really for food. Um, so you might be thinking, well, well, what does he use it for? And I think it's in the book of Ecclesiastes. It says that, that he hangs his picture. He hangs our pictures on his refrigerator. I just think that's pretty cool. And if you go to our house, you'll see our grandkids on our refrigerator. Uh, yeah, that's what God has that refrigerator for. All right, some of us didn't get it. I think I messed it up a little bit. I'm looking at this. But anyway, um, Father's Day. Father's. Boy, if we could really understand how how awesome and how honorable God puts his emphasis on fathers. In the Ten Commandments, remember the Ten Commandments, Moses? Exodus chapter 20. Let's turn there. Exodus chapter 20, verse 12. We all know about numbers in this church. You've been in this church any amount of time. It's the fifth commandment. It's not a coincidence. It's the fifth commandment. Because five is the number of blessings. And you know what? The fifth commandment is the only commandment that has a blessing attached to it. And it's about honoring our fathers and mothers. It's the only commandment that has a blessing attached to it. It's the fifth commandment. The fifth, the five is the number of uh, blessings, I think it's a, it's a very, 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 very special commandment in God's eyes. <sighs> Exodus 20, verse 12, it says, Honor thy father and thy mother, and here's the blessing, that the days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. And again, the land he's talking about is the land of milk and honey, the abundant life. God's saying if you honor your father and mother, you're going to have a long and happy and abundant and joyful life. I think it's pretty cool. I think it's pretty cool. Wow, if we're supposed to honor our earthly father, how about honoring our heavenly father? God has a lot to say about that. I was blessed with was awesome father and mother. But since it's Father's Day, I talk about my mother on Mother's Day, I'm going to talk about my father on Father's Day. But he was a man who, who really sacrificed greatly for his family. Um, he coached us through, through Little League and Babe Ruth. Uh, he always had two jobs. I don't know how he, co he kept to coach us all that time because he always had two jobs. I always remember going to pick him up at his second job. <sighs> he had a very, very hard life. Um, he grew up very poor. He didn't have his mother. His father was very, very, uh, I would say he was a mean, mean man. Uh, the kids were afraid of him. Um, 
when I was talking to him about salvation and I was telling him, you know, unless you ask Jesus Christ to save you, you're going to go to hell. And he said, I've already been to hell. So he didn't have a real good role model to follow. And he, he just turned out to be such an awesome father. I mean, he loved his family and he loved his kids and, and, and he worked all the time to, to provide and give us a life that he never had. To give us a, a much, much better life than he never had. Um, and I've been honoring him for 65 years. I still honor him now. And now that he can't take care of himself, I'm taking care of him. That's honor. That's honor. Because that's sacrifice. There's no love. There's no honor without sacrifice. I'm there for them as much as I can. Most of the time I'm there on Monday through Friday helping clean them up, get them ready. Phone calls, call every day, check on them, call every night, check on them. Yeah, I was blessed. I was blessed with a very, very good father. Now there's many stories. I mean, there's many great stories about fathers in the Bible. I mean... We could probably teach on fathers all year long and not hit the same story twice. But I, I, want, I want to go to this particular story. This was in, this has been in my heart since probably Monday. You know, it's been in my heart. The Lord's been putting it in my heart. It's one of my favorite stories. You know, and I think it's a, it's a story that, like with the Bible, it's a story that we could go out 12, 15 different directions with the story, and I could preach on 12 or different things completely out of this one story but we're going to focus on on uh, one one avenue here and it's in luke chapter 15 most of us are familiar with it it's a prodigal son and you might have heard this message i think most people have but you probably ain't going to never hear the message that i'm going to preach to you today you see I, li I like to go deep i like to go deep in the bible so we're going to go deep in the bible today but let's just go ahead and read it. Luke chapter 15, verse 11. Luke, you want to stand up in honor of Luke? Huh? And most of us have heard it. And most of us have probably read it. But today we're going to hopefully get an understanding that, that we never had before. And, and it has to do with fathers. And, and it has to do with our Heavenly Father. In verse 11 it says, A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of my goods that fall upon me, and he divided unto them his living. So his youngest son said, I want my inheritance now. And if, if you know anything about Jewish customs, he was basically saying, I wish you were dead so I could get my stuff. That's what's really going on there. And now many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country. He went far country. Don't miss that. He went far away from his father's house. And there he wasted his substance, his wealth, with voracious living. And when he had spent all there he had, there arose a mighty famine in the land, and he began to be in want. So he didn't have anything. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country. He wasn't a Jew. And he sent him in the fields to feed swine. If you know anything about Jewish customs, swine is, is the worst thing you can do. God's commandment to stay away from swine. Don't eat it. Don't take care of it. Don't have nothing to do with it. It was an unclean animal. So he was in the worst spot he could be in, being a Jew. He had no food. He had no money. He had to take care of uh, an animal that God said to stay away from. Verse 16, and he would have fain had filled his belly with the husk of the swine that the swine did eat, and no man gave him. He was starving, he wanted to eat the food the swine were eating, and nobody would give him no food. And here's the most important part of the story right here, verse 17. And when he came to himself, when he came to himself, he finally figured it out. I know people who have been in church for 5, 10, 15, 20 years and they still haven't figured it out. They still haven't figured it out. They haven't figured it out. They come to church, they don't get it. They hear the messages, they don't get it. It doesn't change their life. 
It doesn't move them to do something different. It doesn't, it doesn't, it, it's the same old, same old. Yeah, I came and heard the message. How come one person's whole life turns around and the other person just walks off like, he didn't get it. He didn't get it. The Bible calls that dull hearing. So I hope you get this message today. And if you're not praying to God to show you and reveal to you the Bible, you're not going to get it. It's just going to be another story that you heard one Sunday and it don't mean anything and it won't change your life and you'll be on the same road of destruction that you've been on. He came to himself. He finally saw my way ain't working. <laughs> wow. I wish I could preach on that right now. We, it's, it's sad. How come Christians... My way ain't working, but they don't want to change nothing. They don't want to make a move. They don't want to change. They keep on going. They're, they're, not, they're not happy with their way. They're miserable in their way. They're not getting blessed in their way. And yet, they do nothing to change. We're going to see this kid turn his whole life around. Because he finally figured it out. My way ain't working. <laughs> I figured that early. I, when I got saved, I figured it out. I, my way didn't work. I put away my plans 28 years ago when I got saved. I put away my plans and, and took God's plans. And it's been working really, really, really good. When we come to church here, it isn't just to hear the Word of God. It's to get the wisdom, knowledge, and understanding of the things God wants to bring into your life to turn your life around and make it be the life of your dreams. That abundant life in John 10, 10. We're all supposed to have that. We all have the same father, don't we? We all have the same father. Shouldn't, shouldn't every child of his life be the same? He wants to bless every one of his children just the same as he wants to bless every other one. So why aren't we blessed? Why aren't we blessed like the other ones are? I hope we'll get this message. He finally came to himself. He said, my father has many hired servants. They have bread enough to eat and they have even, even to spare. And he goes, I sit here and perish with hunger. I perish with hunger. I could throw other things in there. What, what are you hungry for that you're perishing for? You're not just bread. How about you hungry for love? You're hungry for joy? You're hungry for peace? You're hungry for prosperity? You're hungry for a blessed marriage. You're hungry for your family to be saved. You're hungry for the Word of God. You could throw everything in here. I'm not going to get off the path. i got to stay on the path here. He's not just talking about bread. Verse 18, I will arise, go to my Father. I'll say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before thee, and I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. So he finally figured it out. He said, I got no choice. I'm going back to my father's house. This ain't working. My way ain't working. I got to get back to my father's house because I know there's blessings there. I know there's blessings there. I've seen the blessings of God and how foolish was I to walk away from my father's house. I'm no worthy, no more worthy to be called thy son. Verse 20, and he arose and he came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion, ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Father did five things, number of grace, don't miss that. What's cool about this? What's cool about this verse? It said when he was a great way off, the father saw him. That's just awesome, man. That just puts a chill down my spine. His father was out looking for him. Praying every day, I hope my son comes back. I hope my son comes back. It wasn't a coincidence that he saw him the day he came back because he was out there every day looking for him, praying for him, asking God to bring him back. And if you know anything about Jewish custom, men didn't run. Men didn't run. It was, it was beneath a man to run. It was undignified for a man to run. You didn't run. So a lot of people don't get it when he said his father ran. He didn't care about nothing except going to see his son. If I look undignified, who cares? If it's against my custom, who cares? The only thing I care about is I see my son and I'm running. I want to get my hands on him. 
And he ran up, fell on his neck, and kissed him. And the son didn't even get a chance to talk. He ran up and kissed him. Finally, the son said, I've sinned against heaven and thy sight, and no more worthy to be called thy son. You know what? The father didn't even listen to him. He didn't even listen to him. He didn't even say, yeah, but you know, you, 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 you didn't care about me. All you cared about is, is, is my money, and, and you didn't care about our family. You just want, all you cared about, he could have said a lot of things, but he didn't. Look what he said. He didn't even talk to his son. His son's here begging for forgiveness. And the father just looked at his servants. And he said, go get the best robe and put it on him. Go get the ring, put it on his hand. And go get shoes for his feet. Three things. We all know that number three, the fullness of God. I'm going to read the rest of the story, but I'm only going to teach up to verse 22. But I'll just read the rest of the story so that we get it. And then he says, bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead, is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to make merry. So they made a big feast. They got the calf. They killed the calf. They're having a big old party celebration. His son's back. Now the elder son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called out to one of the servants and said, what do, what do these things mean? And he said unto him, Thy brother has come, and thy father has killed the fatted calf, because he had received him safe and sound. And he was angry. That's a whole other message, guys. And he would not go in. He didn't want to participate. Therefore came his father out and entreated him, and he asked him, What's going on? And his son said, Lo, these many years I do serve thee, neither transgress I any time thy commandment, and yet thou never gave me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this thy son was come, which has devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed him for him the fat cat. You never gave me a party. Why are you giving him a party? I've been here all the time. I've been faithful. I've been doing all the work. I've been here doing what you said to do, and you never gave me a calf. you got two boys here that didn't understand the father's love. Neither one of them did. Again, that's another message. And he said unto him, Son, thou art with me forever, and all that I have is thine. And it was meet that we should make merry and be glad, for this thy brother was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. I wish I had time to preach on this whole thing, but, but we would be here at least till Thursday or Friday. But I want to focus on verse 22, because this is cool. I, I like the deep things in the Bible. People read through these things, and they just go through them, and yeah, okay, yeah, he got a robe, and he got a ring, and he got some shoes. Yeah, okay, that's good. Little little presents he's got. No, 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 no. Let, let's find out what's really going on. All right, let's go deep into the deep waters and find out what's really going on. What do these gifts mean? These three gifts... We're meant to show the son that he was his son. And to show the son how much his father loved him. These three gifts that this father gave his son is the same three gifts that our father gives us. When we become sons and daughters of God. If you're a child of God. If you've been saved. If you've asked Jesus Christ to save you and you're a child of God. These three gifts are for you. And hopefully when we get done with this message, you're going to have an understanding of God's love that you never had before. Because to understand love, <laughs> a lot of people say, I understand love. No, you don't. I look at your life. I can look at you. You don't understand the love of the Father. You don't understand agape love. You don't understand that supernatural, spiritual love. Not like I do. Some of us do. And some of us don't. But when we get done with this message, we're going to see something here. We're going to see something here at the end. The first thing he says, 
the best robe. The best robe. If we turn to Isaiah chapter 61. That's what Jesus, that's why God told us to study the Bible. You know, he didn't say read the Bible. He, there's nowhere in the Bible does it say to read the Bible. Study the Bible. There's a big difference. There's a big difference. Study robe. Study your own. If you don't have a concordance, you can't study the Bible. A concordance is a book that has every word in the Bible in it, and it tells you what the Hebrew word means, and it tells you what the Greek word means, and it tells you where it's at. You go to robe, you look up robe, and it tells you all the scriptures of robe is. That's studying the Bible. I already did it for you today, so I'm going to explain it to you. Isaiah 61, verse 10. God's talking about the Spirit of the Lord coming down, proclaiming the day of the Lord. He's talking about His people. And then if we jump in, I wish I could teach in Isaiah 61 right now. We don't have time, but let's go down to verse 10. He says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God. For He has clothed me with the garments of salvation he has covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments and as a bride adorneth herself with jewels. Why are we greatly rejoicing? Because we're saved. Because he's adorned us with the garments of salvation. Only people who are saved can have these. The robe of righteousness. Only if you're saved will God give you the robe of righteousness because He doesn't give the robe of righteousness to those who are unsaved because they're not His children. They're not His sons and they're not His daughter. Did this father right here give the robe of righteousness to his servants? Did he go get the best robe for his servants? Only for his son. And our God the Father has given us the robe of righteousness. Do we understand what that means? That means all the sins that I have, that are, are, and I have a lot, he puts that robe of righteousness around me, and he don't see my sins no more. He only sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ. What an awesome gift the Father gives us. What an awesome gift the Father gives us. I could wish I could teach on that. I don't have time to teach on that. It's only for His Son. It's only for the Son. We have a blood covenant with God. Do we understand what that means? Only those that have a blood covenant with God and offering the blood of Jesus Christ can be called sons and daughters of God. He says He gives them power to be sons and daughters of God. Do we even know what covenant we have with God? Do we know? What? The Old Testament means the Old Covenant. The New Testament means the New, new Covenant. What's our covenant? Hebrews chapter 10. He, a covenant is, is a legal, it's a blood covenant, it's a legal, a binding, a binding contract between two people. It's a contract between God and us. It's a contract between our Father and us. It can't be broken. It can't be broken. Hebrews chapter 10. You know what our covenant is? I don't have time to teach on Hebrews 10, but if we look at verse 16, Hebrews 10, verse 16, way in the back of your Bible. If I went and had somebody, we did the roof. We had to sign some papers, right, Dustin? Kevin, we had to go sign some papers. It was, it was a legal agreement. They agreed to do the roof. We agreed to, we agreed to pay, him, pay him that money. It's a legal agreement. Well, this is a blood covenant. It's a legal agreement between our father and his children. Look what he says in verse 16. This is the covenant that I'll make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. And their sins and iniquities I will remember no more. That's, a, that's God's covenant. 
That's his promise. He said their sins and their iniquities, I will remember no more. That's the robe of righteousness. One day when I stand before Jesus Christ, he ain't going to see any sin that I committed. He's not going to see any sin I committed before I got saved. And he ain't going to see any sin I committed after I got saved. Because I'm wearing the robe of righteousness. And if you go and look in the book of Revelation, it talks about the saints of God all dressed in white. The robes of righteousness. Holiness. White always represents holiness. We're clothed. We're going to be clothed in holiness. We're going to be clothed in His righteousness. If He remembers any of my sins, then this covenant is no good. That's why we know we're going to heaven. There ain't no doubt about it. Because he said, there's sins and iniquity. I don't remember no one. Well, well what, if, what, what if you kill somebody? What does it say here? There's sins and iniquity. I don't remember no more. What if I rob a bank? Your sins and iniquity. I don't remember no more. What if I do this? What if I do that? What if I do that? Your sins and iniquities. I don't remember no more. That's the robe of righteousness. Second thing I'm going to talk about is the shoes. Now, there's a reason I'm going to talk about the shoes, all right? Because it, it, it starts out the robe of righteousness, the ring, and the shoes. But if you study the Bible, you're going to see why I'm going to talk about the shoes next. What's the shoes represent? Remember when Moses was standing at the burning bush and God said, take your shoes off? Why? Why? When you read the Bible, if you don't know what the shoe means, you ain't going to know why. Have you studied shoes? Have you gotten the Bible and studied what shoes mean? Remember when Naomi came back and the kinsmen, wanted, they wanted, Boaz wanted the kinsmen to, to buy back her property, Jewish law? And what did he do? He didn't want to buy it. And what did he do? He took his shoe off. Do you know what that means? Do we know what shoe means in the Bible? Shoe means your rights. Shoe means your rights. When God told Moses to take his shoes off, he said, you got no rights. You ain't got no rights here. When the guy didn't want to buy the property, he took his shoe off and said, I, 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 I relinquish my rights to buy that property. I wish I could preach on shoes for an hour. <laughs> now, if you guys think God's asking a lot for, from you, this is going to be worth your whole day coming here. You're going to be glad you came here just to hear this verse. You're going to be glad because this is going to be something you're going to remember for the rest of your life. God calls us to do a lot of things. You ever hear what he, he told the prophet Isaiah to do? Does anybody remember that one? Has anybody ever seen that one? Whoa, whoa, let's turn there. Isaiah chapter 20. And this is why I did the robe and I did the shoe back to back. Because in Isaiah 20, we're going to get the robe and the shoe back to back. Alright. Everybody there? Isaiah chapter 20. Zach, I think I'm going to teach you something here. Justice? Alright. In the year of Tardin came unto Ashdoth, when Sargon the king of Assyria sent him, and he fought against Ashdoth and took it. So the Syrians were coming to make war against the Egyptians and the Ethiopians. Verse 2. At the same time spake the Lord by Isaiah, the son of Amos. Remember, Isaiah is his prophet. So the Lord speaking by his prophet, he speaks by his prophet. Like pastors, he speaks by his pastors. 
Go and loose the sackcloth from thy, from thy loins, and put off thy shoe from thy foot. And he did so, walking naked and barefoot. So he didn't have no robe on. He was naked. He didn't have no shoes on. He was walking barefoot. This is going to be good. Listen. And the Lord said, Like as my servant Isaiah has walked naked and barefoot three years for a sign and wonder upon Egypt and upon Ethiopia. Wow. God had Isaiah walk around for three years naked and barefoot. Can you imagine God telling you to do that? But what's the point? If we don't get the point, we, we, it wasn't for no reason. Because he was prophesizing. He was foretelling. He was foretelling the, 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 the prophecy about how the, the uh, uh, Egyptians and the Ethiopians were going to become slaves and captives. Read on in verse 4. So shall the king of Assyria lead away the e Egyptian prisoners and the Ethiopian captives young and old, naked and barefoot, even with their buttocks uncovered to the shame of Egypt. Had no covering. No covering. Their shame. Wasn't that the same with Adam and Eve? When they sinned? What did they do? They tried to cover their shame with what? Fig leaves. They tried to cover their shame with fig leaves. And God said, oh no, 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 no. You, you, you can't cover your shame with fig leaves. What did he do? He killed an animal. He killed the blood of the lamb. And he put the, the sheepskin on their, on their body to cover them. That's the robe of righteousness. That's the covering of sin. And, and that's why we, the Bible says that we were, we were slaves to sin and prisoners of Satan and prisoners of the dark kingdom. We're not anymore because he's put his robe of righteousness on us. And he gave us shoes. We have rights. We have the right. We have the rights of a child of God. Think about it. Well, my dad still had his mind. You couldn't go up to my dad and say, "Hey, you know, could you could you uh, uh, would you loan me two thousand dollars, or could I borrow your car, or you know, something like that?" Because you didn't have the right. You weren't his son. The shoes represent that we have the rights as children of God. We have the rights to things that, that the children of people who aren't children of God don't have. I'm going to talk a little bit about them rights later on. And you know what? I'm going to talk about them now. We have the right to go to God anytime we want. Hebrews 3 says that, 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 we're, that the throne of grace is available to us in time of need, time of help. We have the right. We have the right to go to heaven. We have the right to go to heaven. Those who haven't asked Jesus Christ, those who aren't clothed with righteousness, those who don't have shoes don't have the right to go to heaven. It's all legal. It's all legal. I wish, I wish we could understand it. Jesus is the judge. There's going to be a court system set up there. And if, if you ain't legally have the right to go to heaven, you're not coming in. We have the right to ask for forgiveness of sin. We have the right to go to God's throne of mercy. We have the right to ask for His supernatural wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. We have the right to ask for His supernatural power. Strength, joy, peace, prosperity, and everything that, that God has, we have the right to go ask for it. The third gift was the ring. Third gift was the ring. A good example, we won't turn there, because I, I want to get this done. But if you want to write it down in Esther chapter 3, Verses 9 through 13. Remember Haman? He wanted to kill all the Jews. He wanted to hang all the Jews. And he tricked the king. And he was going to tell him, I'm going to make you some money. But he was tricking the king into slaughtering all the Jews. 
And what did the king do? He took off his ring and gave it to Haman. And what does that represent? His authority. His authority. Now Haman had the same authority as the king. And he took and wrote those decrees by the authority of that ring. That's what the ring represents. The authority of Jesus Christ. We have the authority of Jesus Christ on us. Remember we talked about the anointings, the priests, the king, the prophet. Jesus was anointed, approved by God, empowered by God. We have that same anointing. What's that anointing? The Holy Spirit. We, we have the ring, the Holy Spirit. Not only does that ring re represent authority and power, it represents the marriage ring. We're married to Christ. Patty's got that ring on. What does that mean? It means that what's mine is hers, and what's hers is mine. When we get married to Jesus Christ, when we ask Jesus Christ to save, what's his is mine, and what mine is his. He, he, he got the short end of the stick. He got the short end of the stick. I got all the power of heaven. I got the joy and the supernatural wisdom, knowledge and understanding, the grace, the mercy. I got all the good stuff. He joined up with me, you know. That's why I try to offer him what I can offer him. My love. Today we honor him by being in this house. We honor him. Read the Bible. God says, when you give me my day and honor me with my day and not do the things you want to do, but honor me with my day. You know what he says? You know what his promise is? He goes, then I will give you the desires of your heart. The people don't know the Bible and they don't understand the Bible. They're missing out. They're missing out on all the blessings of God. We come here today. Uh, it, we honor God. But if, if you're not learning about God, learning about His love, learning about His promises, you're going to miss out on them. Let's go to Romans chapter 8. I love this verse. Again, don't miss, don't miss what we're focusing on here, okay? These gifts are a father given to the son, okay? Just like our Heavenly Father gives us these gifts. But look what, look what the Apostle Paul says in Romans uh, chapter 8 and verse 9. Paul says, they're, they're talking about the flesh and the spirit, okay? And the, and, and the flesh is the unsaved, and the Spirit is the saved, okay, the Holy Spirit. He said, but you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwells in you. That's a sign of the covenant. In the Old Testament, the sign of the covenant was a circumcision. If you were circumcised, that was a sign that you were in covenant with God. Well, we have a new covenant. We're, we don't, the circumcision is old, that's Old Testament. We don't have that no more. We don't have... The priests and the offerings and all that stuff no more. We're in the new covenant. We're in the church. We got pastors and deacons. And the sign of the new covenant is the Holy Spirit. But look what he says. If so be the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. He said if you don't have the Spirit of Christ, you're not, you're not a child of God. You're not a child of God. That's the ring. That's the ring. Authority. Authority. First or Second Timothy. Second Timothy says that, that he's not giving us a spirit of fear, but the spirit of power and love and, and a disciplined mind. That's that's the authority that God puts in us. I, I don't speak by my authority. I speak by the authority of Jesus Christ. He gave me the authority to speak for him as a pastor. When you guys are out witnessing and telling people about Jesus Christ. You speak under the authority of Jesus Christ when you're telling people that they need to be saved and ask Jesus to save them and that only the blood of Jesus Christ can wash away their sins. You speak under the authority of Jesus Christ. That's what that ring's all about. And I'm, I got more sermon than I got time, so I'm going to move quick here. Um, 
probably the most, I'll say the most incredible statement in the whole Bible. This is the most incredible, to me it's the most incredible statement in the whole Bible. If we go to John 17, 23. We've talked about the Father's love. We talked about the, the robe, the ring. I could have just brought you here, but it, it, would have, it wouldn't have been as fun. Jesus, this is Jesus praying to the Father, and he's praying for us, those who are his children. But again, this is the most, to me, it's the most incredible verse in the whole Bible. Look what it says. Jesus said, I and them, that means in us, Jesus lives in us. God's not dead, he's surely alive. He's on the inside, roaring like a lion. God lives in us. Jesus said, I live in them, and Father lives in me. Father, you live in me, that they may be perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me. Jesus said, I, I, because we're saved, the world will know that, that, that the Father has sent Jesus. And look what he says. He's praying to the Father, and thou hast loved them as thou hast loved me. What? That, what is, well, when I read that, I had to read that about ten times. What? What? God the Father loves me the same as Jesus? Oh, wow, that's good. You want to know how much God loves you? The same as he loves Jesus? Think about it. If he's the perfect father, and he is, wouldn't he love his kids all the same? Huh? Think about it. Think about it. This is cool stuff, guys. He doesn't love Marty any less because Marty went fishing five Sundays in a row. He still loves Marty. He don't love me more than Marty because I'm a pastor. He don't love anybody here less than he loves Jesus. What an awesome father we have. Do we understand that love? Do we, I mean, you know, when people, oh, when you understand the love of God, oh, I got to go, oh, I got to hurry up, I got to go, I got one more place, I got to go. If you want to know about the love of God, go to uh, uh, 1 John. 1 John's all about the love of God. Let's go back there, way, way back by Revelation. I got... I got a bunch of stuff to show you, but I'm only going to be able to squeeze in one. You have to come back next week to hear the rest. First John. All right. First John chapter four. And if you know, I talk to people all the time, you know, that that one pastor that came here and said you can lose your salvation. He he doesn't know nothing about nothing. I don't he's been a pastor for four years. I feel sorry for the people in his church. Because he don't know nothing about the Bible. Because God tells us a hundred times or two hundred times that we can't lose our salvation. If we got the, the, the robe, the ring, and the shoes, that, if that ain't clear enough, let's get really clear right here. Verse 17. Look what he says. He's talking about the love of God. All right? He's talking about the love of God. Go back and read. All, all the first John, second John, third John, it's all about the love of God. But look what he says. Verse 17. Herein is our love made perfect. He says, here's, here's how you know your love is perfect for God. That we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in the world. I, <laughs> I know God's love. I'm not going to hell. He says right here. Love is made perfect that we're going to have boldness in the day of judgment. I'm going to walk up and say, Jesus, I'm coming in. I got boldness in the day of judgment because I know the love of God. 
I know the love of God. And then look what he says in verse 18. I wish I had time to do this whole verse, this whole chapter. But he says, there is no fear in love. If you think someday you're going to go to hell someday because you messed up, you don't know the love of God. Because God said there's no fear in love. Look what he says. I didn't say it, he did. There's no fear in love. Because perfect love casts out fear. I'm not afraid what's going to happen to me after I die because I know the Father's love. That pastor that came here and said that he could lose his salvation, he doesn't know the Father's love like I do. I don't even know if he's saved. Because my Bible says perfect fear casts out love. If I thought there was a chance to go to hell, I would have fear. <laughs> I would have fear. But I, I understand the Father's love. I don't know how anybody could think the Father was sending his child to hell. That, that, that's as crazy as it gets. And look what he says. Because fear has torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. And I could talk on fear all over the place. I could talk about not just the fear of going to hell. You got fear about tomorrow because you don't know the Father's love. You got fear about this or fear about that. You got fear, you fear this virus? <laughs> I don't. I don't. I know, I know, my, I know my Father's love. Psalm 91. Every day. There's nothing out there I fear. The only thing I was ever afraid of in my whole life was going to hell. And because I know the Father's love, I know that's an impossible impossibility. I don't fear about what's going to happen tomorrow. I don't fear what's going to happen to my dad. I don't fear about my marriage. I don't fear about this church. I don't fear about nothing because I understand and know the Father's love. There's no fear in perfect love. And when we understand our Father's love, they diagnosed me with cancer about five or six years ago. No fear. No fear. Because I know my Father's love. When I was single, no fear. I knew God was going to bring me a wife. No fear. I didn't fear I was going to be lonely for the rest of my life. I didn't have no fear. Because I know my Father's love. When we had that rough year in marriage, I had no fear because I knew my Father's love. And once we know the Father's love, there is no fear. There is no fear. Let's bow our heads. Holy Father, mighty God, we thank you so much, Lord, for this awesome, awesome teaching, Lord. That we are your children, Lord. And there should be no fear. Not when we have a Father who loves us like, like you do. My prayer is only that we would love you back the way you love us. That we would honor you. Give you all the praise and the glory and honor that you, de you deserve, Lord. And bring you the glory that you deserve. That we would make the sacrifices that you made for us, for you. That we would live a life that puts you first. Help us to love you, Lord, like you loved us, Lord. It's sad that you have to command us, that we have to be commanded to be loving to you with all our hearts. And that ought to just be a natural response for all you've done for us. And Father, all the blessings you poured on us. We honor you today by being in your house on your day. Let us honor you every day as we honor our fathers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.